On the show today, we have Dr. B. David Ridpath, the Associate Professor of Sport Management at Ohio University, President of the Drake Group, which was created in 1999 to help defend academic integrity in college athletics, which uh, honestly is getting harder and harder to do these days. Um, we've got him on because uh, January 28th, Dennis Dodd put a story up on CBSSports.com about a proposed federal law uh, that is seeking to limit skyrocketing salaries of college coaches. Uh, Dr. Ridpath, how are you today? I'm doing well, Gary. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely. So uh, what I really wanted you on for was to uh, help explain exactly what is happening here. Um, it, the cutting coaches' salaries, or not cutting, but at least putting a, a cap on them, uh, would help out a ton of schools. Obviously, I'm at the University of Memphis. Um Memphis can't compete with schools such as Alabama, um, Ohio State, et cetera, the, the top of the top. Um, what I'm curious about is all of the different ways that, that the federal government would be able to get involved with this. Now, obviously, colleges are nonprofits, um, but these, these uh, football programs and, and athletic programs are being run like for-profit businesses. Now, I say that uh, while also knowing that most of the sports on campus, because of Title IX, all that stuff that was put in way back when, um, most of the, the sports on campus do not turn any kind of profit. Football runs the ship for pretty much everything. So I, I do want to hear your thoughts on this because you were, you were involved with this. You, you helped put this bill together. Um, tell me, you know, where, where do we begin and, and where does it go from here? Well, Gary, thanks for the uh, opportunity to talk about the HR 5528, which is uh, the, the Presidential Commission to Study Intercollegiate Athletics. And that's really what I want everyone to understand, that this is a bill that is solely geared towards creating a presidential commission to study intercollegiate athletics for a predetermined amount of time and then make recommendations based upon several things. And the template for that is the Amateur Sports Act of 1978, which really did do some good things in overhauling Olympic sports, Olympic sports governance in America, finally ending the archaic amateurism, amateurism code, giving athletes greater representation uh, on Olympic committees, creating the national governing bodies, those types of things, which have made the, you know, the Olympic movement and sport development in that genre much, much more effective. The one thing with this bill that has stood out, and yes, expenditures will be discussed. And I do want to say it is expenditures. I know that coaches' salaries are certainly the low-hanging fruit and, and what people want to mostly talk about. But it is also talking about managing expenditures in a higher education nonprofit environment. And that's really the, the dichotomy. You said this. You have a nonprofit educational environment where academics is supposed to be first and foremost, yet you're running a for-profit elite athlete development center within higher education. And that's really the rub. And, you know, coaches' salaries, let's specifically talk about that, but certainly unneeded facilities. Um, you know, other, there's a lot of fat that can be cut. There's an arms race. College athletic departments can raise a lot of money and generate a lot of money but they also spend more money than they make for the most part. And there's no stopping because everyone's trying to get an edge. And it does trickle down to schools like Memphis, like Ohio University, who are trying to keep up with schools. And they're already 50 to $75 million behind. And there's almost no way that they can compete. And so, you know, look, the only reason why coaches are paid as much as they are, it's not because they're worth it. They're getting paid in an artificial market because the labor is not paid. So we've got two things here. Some people, Gary, say, well, we shouldn't be capping coaches' salaries or, or limiting coaches' salaries because that goes against capitalism and the free market. But yet, on the other hand, many of those same people are okay with capping the earning power and the marketing power of the college athlete. And I say that you can't have it both ways. If we are going to cap college athletes and not pay them a salary and try to limit their name, image, likeness, all these other things that we've tried to do, then it lends to me, at least logically, that we should look at managing expenses with coaches and also certainly other other unneeded expenditures. I mean, we have coaches making eight or $10 million who then again get another million dollars in bonuses. That is not 
something that goes on in the higher education environment. And so are we going to have college athletics within the higher education or do we need to maybe spin it off and have it actually be a private enterprise? I think there's lots of different ways we can go. But if we're going to continue to cap the players' earnings and say that what the players are getting is enough and continue to pay coaches more and more and more, $10, $15, 20000000 million, assistance to the assistants making $2 million, and yet schools pleading poverty and saying they can't pay the players – We've got to come. We've got to come to some decision here. If we're going to cap one, we need to cap the other, or at least manage it better with caps that only Congress can do. Uh, or let's let both of them uh, participate in the free market. And I will tell you this: Nick Saban won't get his pay, get paid as much as he's getting paid now because the labor will be getting paid. But the reason why we've gone to, gone to Congress, and I know this is a long answer for you, Gary, but oh, the is- reason why. <laughs> Yeah, the reason why Congress is involved is Congress is the only entity legally that can do this. So, uh, look, if I felt we could do something and fix college athletics other ways without going to the federal government, I'd be the first one in line. But unfortunately, we are where we are, and no one within the university systems that I know of, the NCAA, boards of trustees, presidents, ADs, coaches, want to fix the system. Because for 20 or 25 essentially white Gentlemen, it works very well, but it doesn't work well or as intended uh, uh, for for really the rest of us. Okay. And you're right. Where does a Mem- where does a Memphis belong in that system? So that's really why we're we're at Congress right now. So there's there's so many different ways to look at this. You know, I I would want to ask, uh, would you be in favor of you know letting the the Power Five pi- kind of privatize this? And d- because there are some athletic programs that have begun to privatize. Uh, Ole Miss has done it, Florida State has done it, and it's more so a way to get around uh, the Freedom of Information Act, uh, more so than anything, so that you know they don't have to release all the things that they do uh, under under the law. Um, so would it be allowing, you know, it, maybe we just make another division and have Power Five be one thing, and then the Group of Five do something different? Now, obviously, it gets hairy because of basketball and everything else you've got division one which has 353 basketball schools and only 130 football schools because people cannot afford to keep up and yet you almost have to have a football presence because it's the it's kind of the front porch of your university you know memphis alone since they began or since they began winning back in 2014 2015 uh has increased their enrollment has increased what they've brought into the university donations etc um, every year since then, so it has. Football has helped a lot. Uh, Alabama is the same way. Since Nick ha- uh, Nick Saban was hired, uh, their academics have gone through the roof. Their enrollment has gone up, and and they are able to hand pick kind of who they want to come to the school rather than just allowing everybody in. Their academic profile has improved. Um, you know, the the president of the University of Alabama or the former president Bob Witt said that Nick Saban was a a deal, a discount, and he's worth double what he's being paid. But I guess I guess this all comes in with you know the name image likeness bill that's uh that's being talked about. If that gets passed, if everything goes through with that the way that we believe that it will, would that change anything about what is going on with this? Because obviously with Title IX, with all of that, if you're going to pay football players you would have to pay everybody. And if football is the only profitable sport on campus, then how do you justify paying a salary to everybody? Like, it, you see how there's so many questions. Like, I, I have no idea how this would be fixed, but I know that it's broken. Um, where where would you stand on any – I know I just tossed out four questions. <laughs> any of them that you want to grab, feel free. <laughs> well, let me, uh, let me let me walk through them a little bit sl- uh, slower. And, and and I agree, there there is no doubt – that there has been some positive effects of winning uh, on some schools. But that is not a guarantee. I mean, there's been, uh, it, I can tell you, when I was at Marshall, even the days of Randy Moss, we had enrollment went down uh, despite all the, uh, you know, the success that we had. It's not a guarantee and it's not a panacea. The unfortunate thing is, and I, I, I shouldn't say it's completely unfortunate, but when, when a Memphis does have this surge, or you have what they call the Flutie effect, and every school thinks they can do it. And it's impossible for every school to have it in a, in a winner-take-all market, if you will. So that is one thing that's kind of driving this arms race. Um, 
I think that you can have a robust, successful athletic department without, you know, spending so much. But I, I do think you bring up a good point that, and I've always said this, we're not looking at systematic reform. We might be looking at different systems being created. Maybe there are there is a, a cutoff where a school like in Alabama they run their athletic department much different than, say, in Memphis. You know, Alabama can pay everybody, whether the men, women, whatever. They can pay them whatever market the, the market bears, and it would meet all federal guidelines. And maybe those are for schools that have a $100 million budget and up. I don't know. I, I think there's many ways we can look at it. I, I, I just start at the basic premise has to be what we're doing now is not working. Then we can come up with some ideas and really outside the box ideas on how to uh, to make things work. But on the issue of, of name, image, and likeness, I think that's one thing that can certainly work much easier than people believe. I mean, sunshine's the best disinfectant. I know I've told you this before, but honestly, just being transparent will regulate about 90% of this. It won't be perfect by any stretch, but my response to that is as opposed to what? We have a underground black market right now, and, uh, you know, it's not being exposed in many in many ways. If if name, image, and likeness outrages people, they should be outraged right now. And we don't limit outside money and, and marketing ability of any student. And we certainly certainly shouldn't do it for a college athlete. But you know, getting into the to the pay issue, um, a lot of people don't realize that spending on football and men's basketball since Title IX enforcement has increased almost five hundred percent. And this is a, according to the Women's Sports Foundation. So oftentimes, it's not an issue for many athletic departments, even getting to the Ohio's and Memphis's of the world, that if you paid market rate salaries for everybody, certainly wouldn't be as much as Ohio State or Alabama. But it's really where we're spending our money and what, and what, we're, and, and what we're investing in, rather than saying, what could we do more for the players? So in this bill, it doesn't call for players to be paid, but it does call for them to be able to, one, profit on outside money, but also take this money that you're saving from decreasing expenditures and doing things like fully funding baseball, for instance, which has been a a huge issue down in your neck of the woods, right? Um, You know, having more sport opportunities, right? I mean, male sports are still being cut. We're blaming Title IX. It's not Title IX's fault. It's that we're choosing to spend more money on football and men's basketball. So it's really reframing the enterprise. And I think doing something like this, then that we may see more alternatives pop up. I know we have the XFL is starting this weekend. Uh, there is, you know, the G League's doing different things now. There's a, a professional collegiate basketball league that's going to be starting next year. So I think that we just need to evolve as a country. And uh, college sports itself, if we're going to exist in a for-profit environment, then everybody needs to be able to share in that profit. Now, if we really want to make it about education and make that education valuable, we can do that too. But then the coaches and other expenditures need to be capped just like the players. It, it seems like it's something that should have gone into effect well before uh, conferences were allowed to negotiate their own television deals, et cetera. Uh, the money that schools get from television contracts is absurd. And it, the same thing can be said for bowl games, et cetera. I mean, there's a reason why Division One football does not have uh, a full playoff, right? Division right. two, or I guess Division uh, uh, the FCS and Division two, Division three, all have – an actual playoff to find a real national champion. Now, we do understand that if that were to happen uh, the way that it would with FCS, uh, you would have the same teams winning every year, kind of the way that you know North Dakota State and James Madison, et cetera, are winning in FCS. Uh, you would still have Alabama and Clemson, et cetera, but it would give everybody uh, at least an equal opportunity to be able to get there. Uh, Memphis could go undefeated. Ohio could go undefeated and they would not be able to sniff a right. national championship in Division One football. Um, now, it's not the same with basketball, baseball, et cetera. Obviously, you see it, everybody is able to win those so long as they put the resources in and they actually work for it. Um, let's, let's talk about this aspect of it. Uh, Nick Saban's contract with the University of Alabama uh, is not fully paid by the university. Um, Part of it is paid by boosters, right? And it's it's not just Alabama, but it's, you know, I use them because they're they're the biggest of the big. But it is the same thing at Arkansas, at Mississippi State, at, you know, wherever. They have these contracts that are done out where you get a, a certain percentage for being the coach. 
and then you have a certain percentage for uh, coaches shows and so forth and so on. Mm-hmm. And then the biggest pot is paid for by you know a, a private group. Um, and now not every contract is the same, obviously, but is there a way to cap it or limit it if part of those funds are coming from boosters? Because not every school is going to have the same amount. Is there a way to do that? There actually is. I mean, even through a foundation, even a private foundation, it still is an arm of the university. Uh, and all money becomes state money. So even money that goes in the foundation can be restricted in certain ways. So like, for instance, you know, money that comes in the foundation, we can't spend it on alcohol purchases for students, just something, you know, off the top of my head. Um, it can act, money that comes into a foundation can actually be, be regulated. And, and again, you know, I don't want anyone to think that let's just say if this gets implemented in some way. Um, and I believe that there are, there are some ways to do it. It could be, so for instance, at a public institution, most salaries I wouldn't say are capped, but they're in ranges, basically like my position and others, right? Um, the old John Wooden rule at UCLA, uh, and this was just a UCLA rule. It was not anything nationwide or anything, but it, it has some merit that John Wooden, and he wanted it this way, that he would not get paid uh, one. He would be he would get paid one dollar less than the highest paid person on campus. Now let's look around some of these campuses. They've got some pretty highly paid people. Uh, you know, lots of presidents make well over a million dollars, but we have some professors even here at Ohio University who through grants and patents and other things are pulling in a couple million dollars a year. These coaches can still get a great amount, a great amount of money and a great salary by using that type of benchmark. And also, I mean, should we be giving out bonuses? I've always thought, you know, coaches in no way need to get an academic bonus. That's just another way to pad their salary. Uh, you know, should they be getting bonuses for winning six games when they're already making millions of dollars? And for schools like Memphis and like in Ohio, that trickles down and it really damages more here than it does in Ohio State. So if schools can pay, you know, we should let them pay. And, and I've always said it: there should never be a rule that, hey, you absolutely have to pay college athletes. Just lift the cap and see how many schools will do it. And I think we'd be really surprised at how many schools would find ways to do it. Um, Now, would that mean that potentially at some schools, sports would be cut? Possibly. But then as a nation, we have to address that because uh, we're the only country in the world that has a primary vehicle of elite sport development in the education system. So that also uh, it preps our national teams and other things like that. And so then we have to decide, well, if other sports are getting dropped and colleges and universities want to focus on football, and men's basketball, um, then how are we going to support these other sports as a country? And I think that we could do that too. So again, it's more just thinking outside the box and, and saying to ourselves, what can we do different? How can we deal with college athletics as it is and not some mythological concept that isn't grounded in reality? Now, we, we've talked a lot about football coaches and whatnot. Uh, I, I pulled up, uh, and this is from 2018, but the athletic director salaries are not nearly what football coaches make or even basketball coaches. Now, basketball coaches are making more because uh, – there is so much football money coming in and so much television money coming in that the money has to be spent somewhere. But Alan Green at Auburn is only making six hundred twenty-five thousand dollars a year. His basketball coach is making four million. His football coach is making well over seven million. Uh, that just seems weird that the the CEO of a school would be making considerably less than the people that actually work under him. Uh, I, is there another? I mean, other than I guess actors and and when I, obviously this is entertainment, but uh, is there another position maybe in the country where the boss makes significantly less than the employees? Well, I'd say very few, but you're also bringing up a point of where that does really skew also power and authority. I can tell you it doesn't happen or rarely happens in higher education where anybody's making more than the president or making more than their bosses. It happens sometimes. Uh, but we have here in the athletic department where now uh, it's not just you know Gus Malzahn and Bruce Pearl that are making more than Alan Green. It's the offensive coordinator. It's the assistant basketball coach. It might even be the volleyball coach. And because we don't have any counterbalance to those salaries. And I, I did want to bring up something you brought up earlier about one thing that I think should be talked about in the bill, and that is the management of the college football playoff. 
that even though the conferences did win, you know, a court case to do their own televisions, and I think that that's fine if that money, again, is being used for educational purposes and, and, and helping out all sports and those types of things, but it's often not. It's going into salaries on needed facilities and those things. But, you know, if the NCAA managed the college football playoff, and if that college football playoff was a realistic one where at least every conference had a slot, uh, all 10 conferences had a slot and some independents, you know, 12 team, 16 team, whatever you want to call it, right. you know, that, that would generate a significant amount of revenue. Now, of course, the power five doesn't want to share that with the rest of us, but that is one way when people talk about, Hey, how are we going to pay? How are we going to do this? How, well, that is one area where, you know, that money is essentially all controlled by the power five, the Mac and conference USA and others get a mere pittance of that. Uh, but, you know, that's one way to generate some revenue. But you're right. I mean, it's very, very tough for an athletic director or president to also have control over their athletic department if the pay disparity is that much. And I do think that coaches can get by. You know, I think Michael Drake up at Ohio State is making close to a couple million dollars a year as a president. That's a pretty good deal. He gets a free house, gets lots of other things. Coaches get coaches get a lot of free perks. I think Nick Saban, Mike Krzyzewski, and, you know, Bruce Pearl, they would all be fine, you know, making a couple million dollars a year. But right now, that train is not stopping. I mean, we're at $10 million a year with Dabo Sweeney. What's next? Where's the line? And how many more teams are going to get cut? How many more opportunities are going to be taken away? And and in some schools, how, how much are their, their academic and their actual school infrastructure going to be affected by this? I think we just need some sanity, and I do think we can do better with managing budgets. But sadly, it's going to have to be mandated. Now, I guess to, to close this out, obviously I didn't want to keep you for too long today. Um, where where do we go from here? What does the timeline look like? I mean, is this a, a two-year kind of project, or is it something that uh, you would hope to – to have done this year. I mean, obviously right now we're, we're going through an election year. We've got all sorts of different stuff going on in con with, they just finished impeachment. They just finished everything else. Uh, is it something that, that could be done rather quickly or is this something that, uh, you're, you're just getting the ball rolling and we'll see where it is here in a couple of few years. Yeah, it's, it's probably more the latter. I mean, you know, it's interesting. I, I'd love to say that we're just getting the ball rolling, but just honestly getting to this point was about 10 years of work, believe it or not. Um, you know, being able, being able to get essentially, uh, a bill put together, working with various constituent groups, and then having a bill that could be bipartisan supported. That's actually, speaking of the political climate, a very big attractive point where you actually have people like Donna Shalala and Jim Jordan talking to each other. Uh, they would not talk to each other for any other topic, but there is a, a real ripe uh, attitude for um, bipartisan legislation. And so there's been a lot of bipartisanship on this. Mitt Romney and, and Mark Walker, that couldn't be, even though they're both Republicans, couldn't be more more different. And, you know, they were sitting in, in meetings with uh, Mark Emmert a couple weeks ago. You know, so uh, this is real. And I do think that Congress is going to do something. How quick you brought up a lot of things, Gary, is with what's going on election and everything. This is a long game. OK, there is a chance uh, right now where we're at is the bill is through Donna Shalala's and Russ Spano's office, the two main co-sponsors. We all know this from our civics classes, but basically they're trying to seek out as many co-sponsors as possible before it goes into committee. And then it's going to be in committee. There likely will be hearings. Uh, you know, the NCAA will come in and say everything's great. We don't need to do this, that type of thing. Um, so I think we're looking at probably a one to two year time span. And then even if the bill gets passed, then you're talking about, you know, the committee has to be funded, uh, you know, offices, you know, office hearings, travel, all those things, which you like you see. I don't want to compare it to the Warren Commission, you know, but I mean, it would be something like that where there would be meetings across the country. Lots of people would have a chance to give input, written input, oral input. And, you know, then this commission, who Whoever it may be, you know, um, I don't know if, if I would be asked, but, you know, maybe my colleague Donna Lopiano, other athletic directors, presidents, we, we, we would hope, and that's what we put into the bill, that it would be very diverse. People from the NCAA absolutely do need to be on the committee, people from the Knight Commission, but you need people like Jay Billis also, you know, to really have that good, robust discussion. And then that committee would work for two years, that's the charge in the bill at least, and then would come up with, with recommendations that then would also have to be approved. If let's say we get into like an expenditure cap, that would actually have to be approved in addition by Congress. So this is a long game, 
But I've been at this a long, long time. But what I'm very, very encouraged about is one is I saw Title IX succeed when people said there was no way that Title IX would succeed against the, the and believe me, they had some massive, massive roadblocks with the football lobby uh, and, you know, congressmen and senators from Texas. Yeah, it was, but Title IX won out. So that's, that's something that, you know, encourages me. But the changes that we're seeing, Gary, transfer freedom the stipend, the athletes rights movement, um, the big 10 coming out and saying, you know what, we probably need to have a one-time transfer exception for all sports. Uh, you know, just little things like that, that I can tell you, Gary, five, six years ago, talking to my friends in college athletics, they would have said, I'll die before this happens. So changes are happening even while this is going on. And I think what's been proven, Gary, is that we're still watching even though these things are happening. I, I, I heard Lane Kiffin on the radio today saying, oh, we have free agency in college athletics. Well, it's not free agency. It's students doing what students do, and students transfer, and yes. college students should be, who play football or basketball should be allowed to transfer. And uh, But you know what? If you want to call it free agency, at the end of the day, Ohio Stadium was still packed every Saturday. So it really doesn't matter. We, we, think, we, we think these things are going to bother us. We think name, image, and likeness is going to bother us. And, but typically, we get over it really quick when kickoff happens or tip-off happens. So uh, I think we just need to continue to make changes and continue to make this system more equitable and then decide, are we going to go the more profit route or go, or go the more educational route? And I'm okay with going the profit route. But then you do have to pay the players and you do have to privatize and do those things. I think we'll watch either way, Gary. And uh, so we just have to decide which way to go instead of trying to have it both ways. uh, Let's decide which way we want to go with the system. And that's really what I think this bill can decide. I, I do agree with you. I do think that people will watch no matter what. There has never been higher interest in college football uh, or college basketball for that matter. Um, people want to watch this stuff. It, it doesn't matter who's playing. They want to watch. And I think the, the biggest difference in, in everything that you were talking about, all the stuff that's changing and whatnot, uh, the biggest difference is it wasn't changing uh, the pay. Of, of people that have contracts right now that, that, you know, Gus Malzahn has five years left on a $49 million deal. Uh, if that were to be cut down to, you know, the most that you can pay is $4 million as opposed to seven. It's not a huge change, um, but it's, it's still, you know, it's, I'm not going to say it's taking money out of people's pockets, but it is just, it's a, a, a drastic change from the way that things have been going. And I am curious how, uh, how it's going to be received. Not not by the public so much, but by the people that are in charge of the sport. You know, if the NCAA were to take over the playoff, um, all the people that are getting paid by the playoff committee, all the people that are uh, making money off of it, because ESPN has paid billions of dollars for this stuff, and if you're rerouting where that money's going, it it's going to ruffle feathers. So I'm obviously interested in uh, in what is going to happen. So we uh, yeah it. it- Go ahead. It is going to, it is, I was going to say, it is going to ruffle feathers. It's not going to be easy. And again, if I'm a Nick Saban or a Bill Hancock, I, I probably don't want it to change either, but it's, it's doing the right thing. And, and I will tell you, I can't mention his name, but a prominent AD emailed me just yesterday and said, please, please get this done. My response to that is to this, to this person was, you know, look, if, you'll only stand up and do your job. We wouldn't be here. We shouldn't have to get Congress involved. Maybe just the threat of this might actually make universities say, you know what, the next contract is, we're going to actually set a realistic market for this. And the realistic market is, is that our coach shouldn't get paid more than the president. And we don't need Congress to do it. If, co- if, if colleges and universities can do that on their own, more power to them, but they've not shown that ability. But no, this is not going to be easy. It's going to ruffle a lot of feathers. But again, things change. We evolve and we need to evolve in college sports. It, it was not that long ago that, that college coaches did not have agents, you know? There was no reason for Jimmy Sexton or anything. Now, obviously, uh, Jimmy saw a, a big-time opportunity with this, with the TV contracts, the way that they were going, et cetera, and, and he took advantage of it. But, uh, but, you know, college coaches didn't need that. I mean, they're, the, the former Temple basketball coach, Fran Dunphy, um, he was also – an instructor at the school. You know, Mike Leach was oh, yeah. like, even today, he was teaching at Washington State. Now, he would do it during the summer, during the off season, But, you know, now most of these guys are, are only football coaches. 
and that's it. There was nothing else that they would give to the university other than working with that athletic program, and I would like to see it go a little more back to back to the way it was, you know. And I, I don't know that we can get there, but I, I do have faith, and uh, and I am looking forward to it. So he uh, he is Dr. David Redpath. Associate Professor of Sport Management at Ohio University, President of the Drake Group. You can follow him on Twitter at Dr. Ridpath. Thank you so much. We uh we need to get you in here more often to uh to discuss some of these things. Chris and I, uh, he's at Disney World this week, by the way. So I'm running the show solo. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, we we talk about this stuff frequently, and uh, and it, it'd be nice to get a different voice in here. We we need to get you on more often. Anytime, Gary. Really appreciate you and Chris having me on, and thanks so much. Absolutely, thank you.